Welcome back. Let's go. Another episode, Sea Suit Unfiltered. Dude, where did my water go? Okay, whatever. Sorry. Uh, we can get it. It went the abyss. It's all good. We're, we're going to bang this one out. This right. is going to be a quick in out. You're <laughs> okay. a busy guy. I got some hot topics here. Okay. Our last episode, we were a little bit lawn care heavy. Okay, right? lawn care. Talked about a lot of the metrics within the lawn care and landscape industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right? Okay. We're going to go deeper in the right. lawn care landscape industry. Deeper. Because my guy, my, my YouTube guy. peer, Keith <laughs> Kelfis. Oh, yeah. Put up a video. Really? About a week, two weeks ago. Okay. Why I quit mowing lawns and went full-time landscaping. Good stuff. All right. So he drops this 10-minute video, just him looking at the camera thinking and thoughts. his truck. Yeah. He's thinking thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Thinking thought. He's pondering a thought for a minute. Yeah, yeah. All righty. So Keith goes over the... Very general kind of top layer of why he's making this transition in his business. Yeah. Now, I did take a couple of direct quotes from it uh, just so we could kind of discuss and see what his thoughts are on it. Now, he did start in the first 30 seconds. He did say this. If you have pricing dialed in and route density, you can make good money cutting grass. So I do want to put that out there. He did put that asterisk up right at the beginning. He is not saying you can't make money doing lawn care landscaping or lawn care lawn maintenance. Okay. He then went on to say, $40 a cut is the new 20. What are your thoughts on that? I think it's the other way around. <laughs> the, like, or, prices oh, have gone down. 20, yeah, 20 is the you know, new 40. 40. Okay, Sorry, okay. I, okay. see, this is why I have notes. <laughs> so I don't misquote someone. Yeah. Uh, I typed it wrong. So, I yes, would agree. 20 I would is agree. the new 40 a cut. I would agree. Or no, 40 is the new 20. Yeah, 40 is the new 20. Yeah. All yeah. right, either way. What a, I don't know what I said. <laughs> Replay. 40, a cut, is, is, is the, the new, new 20. 20. Yes, you're right. Okay. Yeah, thoughts uh, on that? I agree. I agree. Yeah, prices have gone up. Yeah. Prices have gone up of a lot of things. Right. You know, the cost of equipment has gone up. The cost of fuel has gone up. The cost of labor has gone up. And I would say for lawn care, it's the same thing with landscaping in terms of finding the skilled labor, mm -hmm. like being able to pay them significantly more. If they can do like excavation, if they can do those sort of hardscaping mm -hmm. things, like it's harder to find them and you got to pay them more too. So, yeah. Yeah. So he said, you know, back in the day when he was first kind of getting uh, his, uh, his footing under him while starting his business, you know, it was, uh, I'll do a $15 cut for the tiny little lawn for the 80 year old lady. I'll do the $20 lawn. I'll do the $25 lawn just to get in the market. And he said it was a lot of just like spinning his wheels. So this is another quote. He said, I crunched the numbers and all the math said, I won't have a business business in three months if I keep mowing lawns. That's kind of implied there. So um, what would be your advice? Someone comes to you and says that, Mike, I crunched the numbers and all the math said, not my emotions, that I won't have a business in three months if I keep operating the way I'm operating. You're conflating a qualitative measure and a quantitative measure. Quantitative is that you're going to go out of business. Qualitative is that you're doing mowing services. Hmm. So the reason that, the mo that you will go out of business is not because you're doing mowing services. It's because you're doing mowing services at a loss. Got it. So insert mowing service with any other service. And yes, if you don't make money per service and you do more of them, mm -hmm. you will go out of business. Yeah. So either A, you need to become more operationally efficient or B, you need to raise prices. Yeah. And so like his caveat at the beginning, if he said that is perfect, and that is like A and B. And that is like either A, if you're operationally efficient, i.e. really route dense, or B, your pricing is dialed in, you have high prices, that's how you make money because that's how... Every business yeah. works. Of course. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> and this is like business fundamentals, but it's good to, you know, have these conversations yeah. to see what works for people. And you're, you're clearly kind of on the right train of thought or not right. Same train of thought as Keith, because he basically said he reiterated his first point, the caveat of if you have your pricing dialed in, if you have good density, um, then you can make good money. However, his kind of back, um, or not backlash to that, but his next comment in the video was, but I needed more money now. Mm -hmm. And that's where projects, I can get money yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. Right. So do you see that as something, um, and not saying that this is something Keith did, but do you see that as something that's a commonality in this industry or really home services in general? Well, if I can bang out one project, I can make payroll. If I can bang out, if I can sell one more big job, I can get a deposit and I can cover the cost of my loan or payment or whatever it is. Yeah. Well, no, like, look, I agree. Like if you have a project, yeah. <laughs> you get 50% down really quickly. It is a short term fix for a lot of like short term money crunch pro right. cash crunch problems yep, yep. and even in our training for you know it's one of the three things that we talk about in terms of getting out of a cash crunch is around projects deposits yep. wrapping up projects etc totally um i think that revenue has three different values like 
all, not all dollars are created equal when it comes to revenue. So for example, I think it's a matter of one-time projects, then reoccurring jobs, and then revenue that comes in from recurring mm -hmm, work. Mm -hmm. So um, if you're trying to build an asset, you want the asset to have a low likelihood of not having money tomorrow. And with projects, there's always a likelihood that I will not have projects tomorrow or leads will stop coming in. And so we've seen that mostly in the past 12 months being impacting the project world. Um, whereas the reason, like the, the reason that reoccurring is less, you know, probable that you're going to have problems when it comes to an economic shift is because mm -hmm. it's lower ticket and it's, it happens like once a year or once mm -hmm. every two or three years versus like, I need a, a new putting green. I need a paver patio. That's like a one time situation. Like once every 50 years, probably you're going to put a new paver patio in someone's backyard. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's reoccurring, for example, you're sealing every two or three years, mm -hmm. that paver patio, that revenue is much more predictable. And then if it's recurring where I'm going to come every single week and blow off the paver patio, even higher valuation is put on that revenue. Right. And so if you look at a vet from, look at your business as more of an asset instead of a just a cash flow machine, that's when you start to look at the revenue where you collect it a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. And I personally am interested in growing the, the asset value of my business because the best thing about small business ownership is that valuation increase in a business does not get taxed. Mm -hmm. So if I take a $200,000 business, I add better streams of income, make it more stable, put management in place. I maybe split it up into two different departments or and have two different general managers or two different locations. If I can create a business that's worth from 250 to then now it's become a million dollars, that $750,000 of gained equity doesn't get taxed. Wow. So if a certain someone gets voted in, he's getting political, <laughs> unrealized gains. Yeah, unrealized <laughs> gains will never get passed. It'll never get passed. Yeah. Sorry, that's would, where my brain went. It I would apologize. cripple our economy too much. And secondly, all the big donors would be massive against it. Yeah. Because this is this is the loophole that the rich use to be able right. to get way less taxes. That yeah. you build massive equity and then you never sell. You simply take debt against that equity mm -hmm. to be able to then fund your lifestyle. Meanwhile, that equity never gets sold. Therefore, you never pay taxes on it. Yeah. And then the interest that you pay on said loans to fund your lifestyle is an expense. Yeah. So you make no money on paper. Yeah. <laughs> we can put a pin in that. We can come back to that. I had to take the tangent. Sorry. That's Lee, good. Lee got political. I like it. Hey, like projects are great. Yeah. I think project revenue is good. Um, there are big businesses. I'm not against it. You can make a lot of money doing it. Um, I would just say, please do projects, make a lot of money, asterisks for the sake of the valuation of your business, for the, the sake of being able to hand the business down to multiple generations or, uh, give it to a general manager to run mm -hmm. without you being there, please create some sort of recurring revenue in the business, uh, in, in the event that there's a, an economic recession, in the event that like we've seen over the past two years, a credit, credit crunch and people's backlogs for projects have gone from 12 months down to 12 days. Mm -hmm. Like, please, for the sake of your family, get recurring revenue. Mm -hmm. Um, and then if you want to extrapolate further to be greedy and be capitalistic, for the sake of having a better valuation that you could one day sell the business, uh, please like focus on a different type of revenue besides uh, the next one time job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, this is totally anecdotal evidence. It's just a story. I mentioned this to you, I think off the pod, but might as well share it. Uh, someone local in our market that strictly does large projects. I just and literally referred him over to someone oh, at the nice. gym. <laughs> so he, he does it like they don't show up to a job site for less than $50,000, oh, okay? Yeah. So they are going to, uh, they would be massively hurt in a recession. And even this year, he's, I, I ran into him at a gas station. I think yeah, I told yeah, you the yeah. story. And basically he said, we would not have enough work if I hadn't secured a couple of very large uh, new like apartment complex um, designs. Yeah. And those are backed by large private equity firms or funds or whoever. That's yeah. not the individual homeowner. Now, like you were saying, once every 15 years, I think you said, um, you know, a homeowner might do a massive renovation. Well, there you go. That's, you know, $50,000 if they rip out all their landscaping and reinstall. Mm -hmm. But those are going to be gone when there's a recession, yeah. typically. Yeah, most most companies have been really hurt. Like um, uh, Hust, J, uh, Huston, what's his name? Jim? Uh, Jim Houston. Yeah, yep. Jim Houston. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, he said it at Landscape Summit last yep. year. And it's like, look, all these big project companies that had 12 and 24 month backlogs are really, really hurting right now Yep. Um, because people are backing out of projects. The cost of capital is too high for these big jobs to go through. People don't want to take a HELOC and get the new $50,000 project done when that cap cost of that capital is 10%. Mm -hmm. um, they were 
a lot over the past 15, 20 years since the last economic recession because interest rates have hovered between zero and 4%. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, anyways. Yeah. I'm not against projects. I just no, no, no. beg people to think about the long term <laughs> and their net worth <laughs> and the fact that you build a business to be able to reduce your tax liability when you make money. And so making money today is is great, but please think about the future. Think about your family. I don't like to see, like I've just seen too many times when people put all the eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. And I would also say like, don't just do recurring, like have projects in there to be able to uh, fill the job, fill a schedule when you need it. Mm -hmm. Like we use it a lot. Like we might have a recurring that uh, kind of turns down 20, 30% during, say, the summer months. Well, we need projects to fill that. Totally. And so I think a good balance between the two in any seasonal business is important. If you don't have a seasonal business, you don't need. You can pick one or the other and you're fine. If you have a seasonal business, you need to have a balance of both. Yeah. This, this will make your heart happy. Okay. So in our market, our more price-sensitive customers, or the folks that just don't water their lawn, this is when they start skipping, asking to go bi-weekly. Yeah, but it rained. But potentially even canceling. Yes, it did rain. Yeah. But this is some good news I heard from one of your general managers. They're almost booked all the way through September with projects. Really? Supplementing with projects. Yes. Dude. To counteract that your your mowing slowly goes down, right, as it gets later in the year. They're most, booked up to the end of September. In most markets. Almost. Dude, good for them. Yeah. That's to make your heart happy. That makes happy. Let's go. <laughs> so projects, okay. even your locations, like you are the guy probably on YouTube that's known as the proverbial like recurring, recurring systems, recurring. But even your one of your businesses like still supplements heavily with projects, yeah. one-time projects. Yeah. Now this is where people would say they're pro project or pro this project. Is, this is where the this is where the conversation flips. Boop, boop. This line from Keith: Our okay. average ticket job went from three hundred and twelve. Let me guess what the average ticket and is. And 50 cents. Let me guess. Two. Let me guess. Let me guess. Let me guess. Well, what was the first one? Went from what? You got too excited. 300. Now, I don't know what the time frame is on this data. If it's yeah, including yeah. each monthly, individual mo. Monthly, or monthly. recurring. Right? Yeah. So their average ticket job yeah. went from $312.50 to... Four thousand five hundred. Oh no, a lot less. Uh, One thousand six hundred forty-nine fifty. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and that's their average. He did say that a lot. Their their bread and butter for like multi-week projects is like a ten thousand dollar job. He said his okay. crews are great at just knocking out like a, a whole new hedge installation right. or a whole new landscape uh, redesign for ten thousand bucks. He said they do a lot of those. The average though, but the, I mean, if you look at that, the average basically increased five and a half x. Right. So I think that alone, just that one line in that video, is why people. People are like, oh, well, then obviously I should go projects. What are your thoughts on that to the proverbial viewer out there that hears that line and they're like, well, yeah, I should lean into projects. This isn't towards Keith. It's I think you should lean into projects. I yeah. should also, I also think you should lean into recurring revenue. Yeah. I think you just make more money. Yeah. Whatever makes you more money, please lean in, baby. Yeah. Let's right. go. Fair enough. So this is, this is one, uh, one kind of little uh, metaphor Keith used that I like. This is the last thing from his video. It's, it's recurring mowing is like holding a funnel and trying to fill it with these tiny pebbles and they keep falling out the bottom. But imagine it was just bigger rocks. <laughs> 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 yeah. But what happens if the rocks stop falling? Yeah. Like that's what I'm afraid. Like, okay, look, let me be clear. If your average ticket size is a thousand dollars on projects, mm -hmm. you are not doing massive projects right so this is very different yes this is property cleanups this is small this is what we do yes at belly i'm sure it sounds like that's what he does but he's done mowing like he yeah, handed yeah, them yeah, off yeah, yeah yeah um i'm just saying i want to be clear like yes that's a different extreme like we're not talking about fifty thousand dollar jobs right, right. Now. um so i just look at business a little differently um, I think it much more from an asset perspective. I think it much more about like, can I build this to run without me mm -hmm. in the next 10 to 15 mm -hmm. years? And if I can't, I have no interest in building it. Because if, if you're just going to show up to the next project to do the work and earn that money and make good money on it, why not just get a good paying job? Hmm. Right? Like, and that, yeah. That's why a lot of people will quit this industry and any like home service industries because eventually, if you're just doing one-time jobs, basically it's like, I must work in order to make money. That's what you should do as an employee. Mm -hmm. And so it's much more stable. You get better benefits. There's a lot of benefits to be able to do that instead of just get, trying to get the next job and that stress that comes with it. I want to build a business that takes me twice as long to build 
if not three times longer to build. But there's systems and people in place that run, make it run without me. And it's easier to do that for the recurring work because I don't have to build an infrastructure and, and a uh, uh, overhead structure of office and equipment and, and staff and all this around something that I don't know is there tomorrow. Mm. And you just don't know that with projects. Mm -hmm. And the reason that it is, I've, I've been saying this for like four years, so it seems like I'm a you know crazy yeah. guy out in the wilderness <laughs> talking, but like recessions happen. And recessions wipe out projects way more than recurring. Mm -hmm. And if you don't believe me, look at the top 100 uh, companies, landscape, and lawn and landscape. And just, just so everyone knows, those are self-reported numbers. That's why Augusta's not on there because I didn't report them this year. <laughs> um, but if you look at those, look at what percentage of the top 10, 20, 50, 100 are recurring. And then look at how long they've been in business. Mm -hmm. And the ones that have been in business for 30, 40, 50 years and have weathered two, three, four recessions, they're the ones that have like more than 50% of their revenue usually comes from recurring. Mm -hmm. So I'm not poo-pooing projects, but when I look at valuation, when I look at the ability to scale, when I look at the ability to be able to be an operator or an owner, but not an operator, when mm -hmm. I, I, an absentee owner, I know that recurring and the smaller stuff works. And I would also say if your average ticket is a thousand dollars, it probably actually falls closer into reoccurring revenue. Right. Because you're doing bush trimming, you're doing stuff that's more maintenance driven. Mm -hmm. uh, like putting in mulch is more of a maintenance activity, in my opinion, even though it's a project. Right. It's reoccurring. It happens every year and it's simple services. Mm -hmm. So I would just say that, um, you know, at Augusta, we think about business a little bit differently. And if people buy into that logic of building the business the way it should be built to be able to run without the owner, that's when my ethos comes into play. If you're trying to maximize revenue this year, I can guarantee you if you turn off all your mowing and you focus only on projects, and if you're in any industry and you stop doing maintenance and you just focus on installs, you will make more money this year. But next year, you're going to have to find more jobs. Yes. And that's the part where I get a little bit antsy about. Mm -hmm. And one thing Keith said in the video is that he got really good at sales. Like he really wanted to figure yeah. out the sales side. So if you're great at sales, typically mm -hmm. that also means you can fight the recession a little bit better, really in all industries. If you're good at sales, you can fight whatever negative forces there are impacting your industry. So he, he did say that and he did lean into that. But I think one thing with this funnel analogy, that's kind of funny because you said, well, what happens if the, the big rocks stop falling? There's yeah. a recession. People- Or even a couple. Yeah. A couple yeah. big rocks don't come. A couple out. big rocks stop falling. Here's the cool thing about all those little pebbles falling out the bottom. You just plug the funnel. Yeah. Right? And that's what we talk about with customer attrition. Yeah. Like how can we make so much value that people don't leave? Yeah. Right? And I feel like we did that a little bit during the COVID years when you were still more active in your, in your local locations that we really focused on like high quality, like high touch, like really wanted to make sure the customers were happy with the service. So we did not lose them during the yeah. COVID years. Yeah, and if you look at like even the past four or five years, as I have worked less and less and less and less at the Bellingham shop, for example, and now like I don't show up at all, mm -hmm. The, the difference is one thing. We reduced the amount of projects we did and more and more of the revenue became recurring. Yes. And that's what allowed like every single time in UGM, like Liz, Lee, <laughs> Marcus, other people, Corey, every time <laughs> it has come through, yeah. it's like cut out services, cut out yes. services, simplify, standardize, create systems because like that's what works without the owner having to be there being like, oh, do this and like this and like, oh, whatever this and like, oh, make sure this piece of equipment's done right. Like you've got to simplify things. Yeah. Well, and that, it was kind of a natural progression for your location was, okay, I moved into the general manager role. So now you had two like solid, I'd say three solid, like hardscape kind of project managers. Yeah. Well, now I moved into a manager role. So you just lost 30 to 50% of your capacity to do those hardscape, multi-day, week-long type projects. Yeah. Okay, then we lost another one of those guys, yeah. and then Brad moved on to yeah. do the CPA stuff. So then all of a sudden- We had one. We had one <laughs> who could do it, right? And so it was like, oh no, what are we gonna do? Then Marcus came in and like, I moved out of the Bellingham shop. So now we didn't even have anyone with like a higher level knowledge of these yeah. projects. So Marcus just slashed all hardscaping. Yeah. So in the course of three years, it was like, okay, we're gonna do these huge 20, 30, $50,000 jobs, and then, Three years later, it's like, we don't even touch pavers. Yeah, Mar Marcus <laughs> is such a goat. Yeah. <laughs> Marcus really slashed everything at the Bellingham shop. Yeah. But increased profits. Yeah. So it's a beautiful thing. All right. So that's Keith Kelfus. That is that's once good. that is educational. Keith's a great guy. It's a good yeah. video. Check it out. We're not taking a stance. Here was one thing I did want to share with you, though. Scroll through the comments. There's over 120. Whoa. I only saw one that was like pro, like hardcore pro defending recurring. Okay. I, I'm not against. I'm I know, not against I know you're not against projects, but does that say anything to you 
Like, it's just his audience. Scrolling through the comments. No, okay. like his yeah. audience is project prone. Mm-hmm. And then my pro- my audience is more recurring prone. Yeah. So it's just yeah. like, there's no right or wrong. Yeah. It's like, what are you trying to build? Yeah. And so I have just found that doing recurring is better from a owner's perspective that wants to not be there and from a valuation perspective if you were ever to sell. And I know that I own a business in order to be able to improve my net worth without paying taxes. Yeah. Like if I go get a job and I make a bunch of money and I was offered a lot of money to work as an executive. It's so like I, when I said that, like the reason is, is because I don't want 40% of my paycheck going to the government. Mm. And so I can protect that from happening as a business owner. Yep. And that is my value of my, my net worth goes through the roof. And last year, I'm not paying any taxes. Yeah. And that is, that is only done through business ownership. Mm-hmm. And is that, that is done through like not having to take a lot out to live on. Because when you do that, you have to take distributions. You have to take income. But if you don't have to take a lot of stuff out of the business, you can let that asset just rise in value mm-hmm. without any sort of tax consequences whatsoever. Mm-hmm. If you do it right. And so, anyways, that was my yeah. little tirade. You're good. But uh, nothing against, against uh, <laughs> uh, Keith. I love him and all his audience. They're awesome. Um, but I would just say, please, 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 um, we have not seen a recession in 14 years. There will not, I can guarantee you there will be a recession one day. And um, it will wipe these people out that don't have any recurring revenue. Yeah. And so I just beg. I beg. If you haven't been in business for 14 years, please, please. Just add some recurring revenue. Because if you've been in business for more than 14 years, you went through the recession. And actually, I would say 20 years. You need to be in business for 20 years to really understand what a recession actually looks like. Hmm. And so I talked about this like three or four years ago when we, talk, we were talking yes. about like get ready yep. for something, get ready for something, and like prepare the business for it. And I said like, I interviewed like five, maybe six, maybe six owners that had been in business for like 30 to 40 years in the lawn care and the landscape industry. And they all said the same stuff about recessions. And that's when we really started to like, okay, like we got to pull back from projects. Like we mm-hmm. got to, like, I'm not thinking about if, if the whole point in business to win is to stay in business, I should be doing everything to, to re- reduce the risk of going out of business. Mm-hmm. So whether that be key man risk, whether it be services that potentially dry up during a recession, whether that be political things, like uh, uh, things around uh, legislation that could be changing that would completely wipe out my industry. Like, like oh, we're only going to do this one type of thing because, like, it's a law. Well, what happens when that law changes? Right. Like, just take out the, the fragile parts of the business. And so, um, yeah, a recession is going to it'd be bad. Like people really got a taste of it in 2020 for like two, three weeks. And I had massive companies calling me and be like, we're, we're, we have no project. Everyone just pulled their deposits or told us to keep their deposits. And not, they weren't doing projects. Yep. The government stepped in within a matter of two to three weeks, everything changed. Yep. But people forget so quickly what they felt like in those two or three weeks. Cause I've seen the same companies that called me during those couple weeks, freaking out, going all in on one-time jobs. And I'm like, what are we doing? Mm-hmm. And the reason was because when all that money flooded the market, guess what did really, really, really well? Projects. Yeah. Cause everyone had HELOC and everyone had free money um, and, and not free money and cheap money too. Like from, from yep. yeah, being yeah. a loan. loan. Yep. So anyways, no, you're good. I just, I just, <laughs> I will be crazy until that happens. And I'm just saying the reason I'm crazy until it happens is because I don't want you to go out of business. And like, you just got to play a little bit of defense here. Like play offense, play 60, 70% projects, but please have a little recurring to make yeah. sure your family is fed during a recession. Defense wins championships. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, yeah. that was a long tirade. I loved it. It was fantastic. I want to show you this video. We reset the camera. We're jumping right back in. Like the Elon Musk Twitter thing is one of the best examples, right? People argue that you cannot tax billionaires on the shares that they hold in a company because it is an unrealized gain, right? So they go like, yeah, you're worth 300 billion, but we can't tax you on those stocks because you haven't sold the shares. So you don't like have the money. Right, but you're worth the money, but you don't have the money. And so and I understand the argument. They go like, no, you don't have it. It's just what it's worth, because it could also crash, and then you have nothing, so we can't tax you on it. Then I'm like, okay, I understand that. So you can't tax the people on a thing because they, they don't have it. It's just there. Okay, fine. <laughs> then Elon Musk offers to buy Twitter, right? He offers to buy it. And then he says, in his offer, he goes, I'm putting up my Tesla stock as collateral. Then I'm like, so you, you do have it. 
Then he's like, no, 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 no. I don't have it. I don't have it. I'm just going to say it's collab. So then they accept the offer. He now buys Twitter. Now that they've accepted his offer, he now goes to private equity and banks and like other rich people and whatever. He goes like, can you guys borrow me the money to buy Twitter? And then he's like, I'm, I want to buy Twitter because I don't want to sell any of my Tesla shares. So I want to use your money to buy Twitter. And then it's like, but then they're like, what are we loaning it against? And he's like, well, my Tesla shares. <laughs> then I'm going like, wait, wait, so, so you, you, can, you can buy a thing based on what you have, yes. But when we want to tax you, you can say, I don't have it. <laughs> do, do, do you hear what I'm saying here? I wanted to show you this video because we brought up the whole unrealized gains tax. Yeah. And we're not going to go deep into that or whatever Kamala's proposal is. Um, go check someone else that knows a lot more about it. But this clip from Trevor Noah. So this is two years ago when Elon bought Twitter. And he's basically saying, okay, so Elon can say my equity or my shares don't exist if I don't liquidate them. But they do exist as collateral for a loan. And he thinks, he goes on to basically say that's unfair and that's un-American and that he should have to pay taxes on it. What are your thoughts on that as it relates to kind of the unrealized gains uh, tax rumors? Well, let's take off for the second my thoughts on Trevor Noah. Okay, fair let's enough. Yeah, we're take just, that over yeah, there. we'll just put that aside. Um, uh, so let's just talk about that. So Great um, accent. Yeah, right. So <laughs> I would say this, this operates in every form of equity and every sort of getting a loan. Mm -hmm. you, have to have a, you have to have an asset that backs up said um, loan. Loan, yeah. Like, yeah. If something bad happens, I will come and collect this. Yes. Okay. So your house is also an asset. And when you want to go get a home equity line of credit, you still have said house. You don't have to sell said house. But what do you do? You say, if this loan goes bad, you can go get my house. Yes. And here's the thing. You don't pay taxes on the home equity line of credit. You can take the money out of the house and actually have real physical cash and not pay taxes on it. So like every, like our entire economy runs on this. And the reason they do this is because it allows money to move faster inside the economy. The velocity of money or how many times does money change hands is extremely important in an economy. The only way for us to grow out of our debt is either A, massive cuts to interest rates and huge amounts of growth, or it is tax people to wazoo let the current the 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 value of our dollar get completely demolished, mm -hmm. and they have to run the the the, the balance between those mm -hmm. two things. So even before, like when you talked about like Jerome Powell and everything, the reason it is always a game there is because you're trying to balance out the fact that we we can't let interest rates go flying high mm -hmm. because we have this all this debt and we are paying gazillions of dollars on our debt. But then we can't let it go too low because then people will spend too much money and inflation will continue to run rampant. So, wow, that was like well, a long tirade. All yeah. this to say, <laughs> this happens all the time. There's called a loan and there's called equity and that equity can be collateralized. Mm -hmm. And you are not taxed on equity. And if you want to make the argument that we're going to tax equity, get ready for every single billionaire to move their assets offshore. Totally. I was on a call yesterday with an attorney <laughs> considering the options of moving assets to Cayman Islands. Yeah. Now, it's still not worth it for me, Yeah. but there's a level of wealth that you get to and it is worth it. Yeah. And they will do it in a heartbeat. And so the thought, the thought that you're going to tax them and suddenly it's just going to fix everything is ludicrous. It, it would just move billionaires out of the country. They move all of their assets elsewhere or they just move. There are a lot of people that will just move if the corporate tax rate goes to 35%. The businesses, the same way people move from California to Texas, they will move from Texas and like, oh, great, we'll, we'll move down to Mexico City. Mm -hmm. So like, you have to think about a competitive marketplace where these people have options. These are not people that are tied down to any one location. They have four or five jets. They could really live anywhere in the world and be just fine. So the thought that you're going to somehow pigeonhole them by saying, oh, well, we're going to just tax you for the sake of you having any sort of wealth is so crazy. They'll just move. Mm -hmm. And when they move, guess where that money goes? Another place. And they'll create jobs there. Mm. So let's, let's not fight ghosts, as you like to say. Someone comes at you. They just heard you say, I didn't pay any taxes last year. Well, that's so dumb. You have all these businesses. You have all this. You need to pay your fair share. Yeah. So I would agree with you. Um, <laughs> You go out and create the jobs. You invest hundreds, millions of dollars into R&D and technology that's losing money. Um, and if you don't, if you take that tax incentive away from me, I will not invest as much as I do into, into Copilot. Hmm. 
Because I know I can take a massive loss against my income, and that's why I will pump massive amounts of money. I will live very, very frugally so I don't take any money out of the business because that gets taxed. But I will let the businesses have massive losses. Those massive losses, there's what, a team of 35 people that depend on feeding their family based upon me investing into Copilot, which is a losing business venture. And the only reason I do continue to do it at such a high rate is because it offsets all my income and all the other businesses. Mm -hmm. So... Go talk to those 35 people when I have to go lay them off because no longer can I take these losses against my income right. and other businesses. Yeah. So, um, of course, I'm biased because I'm taking advantage of these things. Um, I think that the people that are criticizing them, for example, his boss does this. Right. So, be very careful about do you, do you saying this sort of thing because you're buying the hand that's feeding you. Mm -hmm. And if you're going, like, same thing with polit politically. This is why it'll never get passed, because you say that stuff to get the votes, mm -hmm. but you'll never actually pass it because the hand that's feeding you, i.e. your big donors, are all using these exclusions. Yeah, of course. So um, I'm actually, like, from my perspective, I'm happy to pay taxes. I just need a, I, I just want a rule book. Give me the rule book, and I'll play by it. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to call people um, bad or horrible for getting it, then you need to go vote, and you need to get people in there that make the rule book clear for us. Because as someone with money, you have attorneys and you have tax accounts that are going to give you information and tell you how the game should be played. Mm. And we're going to play it exactly to the letter. You can audit me and you will not find something. You can audit most employees. They're doing side gigs and doing other stuff and they will have to pay more taxes. Mm -hmm. um, and so the bottom line is that what they're doing is completely buy the book. Change the book, go vote. So if you really believe that there should be a go vote. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, if that was to happen, it would be bad for the economy. Because those billionaires have options. They can live anywhere in the world. They can move their assets very easily, and they will move that money and take all that R&D, and Tesla will no longer be in Texas. It will be in a different country. Mm -hmm. They'll just move it. Just move and there'll Mexico. be other companies, <laughs> there'll be other cities, there'll be other um, countries that'll be like, yeah, we'll give you no tax for like six years if you just move your headquarters over here. Yeah. That will happen. Yep. And so if you're going to be anti-competitive, get ready for all of our R&D. The reason that we have become the tech like hub of the universe is because of these policies mm -hmm. that allow for these tech companies to be able to hire, allow them to be able to do these things. And if you want to get rid of that and make everything equal, great. Just get ready for all of that talent and all of the R and D to go someplace else. Mm -hmm. Cause I, like, someone like me is not going to stop because someone says, Oh, like there's a tax policy. I'm like, okay, great. Well, we'll go over here. We'll do it. Yeah. So anyways. Yeah. And at the risk of sounding like an echo chamber, cause I do like to play devil's advocate. Who are the people employed at the Texas Tesla Gigafactory? Middle class and upper middle class people. Mm -hmm. So all of those people just lost their jobs. And a lot of the, that's the argument on the right, uh, which people obviously know that's where you and I both kind of tend to lean, generally speaking, mm -hmm. um, that when you impose these new tax laws and all these um, bans and restrictions on these corporations, you're really just going to hurt the middle class because mm -hmm. the middle class are the working force of those big corporations. Now, to be clear, I think there are plenty of loopholes that should not exist. Yes. Um, the, things is that, the thing is this, I am going to use those loopholes. And I'm going to save money. I'm going to take that money. I'm going to invest it back into the, the company. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to invest it back into more stuff for them. Now, the person is like, well, there's all, these billionaires are spending money on, on buying jets. And the, guess what? Like, someone had to make the jet. Yeah. And someone had to, like, make the pina colada that they're drinking all day long. <laughs> and that money goes down. So, like, this comes down to trickle down economics, whether or not you believe in that yeah. or not. And it's just, I'm not that as much as free market. Like, don't get involved in our stuff. Because when you start making artificial things, people that have the resources are going to move away. Mm -hmm. And, like, my biggest fear for America is we get so much into tax the rich. We get so much into even just taxing employees in general. Mm -hmm. We get so much into the lives of our people. That's why, like, COVID, I immediately went, like, I'm like, they should not be getting involved with this stuff. This has nothing to do with the government. Mm -hmm. Like, why is this a political thing? This is yeah. a health crisis. Yeah. <laughs> and so when I saw that, it was like... um. I, 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 as someone with resources, you want to run away from it. And if that happens in this country where we make it very difficult to make it economically feasible to make massive losses, the ability to go bankrupt, the ability to be able to tax loss, ta tax loss harvest and be able to take losses in one company and apply them to income in another, if you lose that, you will simply move to another country. Mm -hmm. And like I have researched what it looks like to move to these <laughs> other countries and it's not that bad. 
Yeah. They're, they're very open arms to people that have money. Of course. So, anyways, that was just my, Why wouldn't you be? my word of it warning. Seems, it almost seems like a land that, you know, used to be the land of prosperity and yeah. opportunity should want to embrace people that have lots of money. Yeah, and if you theory. think that there are bars holding you back from making more money, if you think that there are bars holding you back from being privileged, quote-unquote, if you think that there are bars from holding you back from moving or getting a better job, then guess what? You're right. Yep. Yeah. One thing I did want to say, because you kind of mentioned, okay, corporate tax rate goes above 35%. You're going to lose all these corporations. They're going to move out. They're going to move to the Cayman Islands, whatever it is. Well, they wouldn't move to the Cayman Islands. They would move their tax. Yeah, their assets and tax. Yes, yes. And I'm not an economist. I'm just a layman here. So now let's let's flip it. Let's say we go the exact opposite. Like America has this huge uh, economic revolution. And they say, hey, corporate profit, like income statements to CEOs, C-suite, whatever, like we're not taxing anymore. We're still going to tax, you know, environmental infrastructure type taxes, right? We should still tax corporations for that to protect our environment, protect our infrastructure. But they say like gains, profit, we're not taxing that anymore. What happens to the American economy? If you don't, if If you you don't don't tax tax capital gains. Yes. Oh, I don't think that's a good idea. No, I'm a big fan of taxing capital gains. Like when you sell things, you should you should be a, you should be paying your fair share. What about just end of year profits, corporate co- corporate profits? Well, right now, like the you know we have a relatively low corporate tax rate, um, and compared to like Western civilized countries, mm-hmm. um, and that has allowed for companies to move into and continue to you know invest in our country. Um, there's 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 pros and cons. Like I see both sides of the coin on this in terms of raising corporate tax rates. Keep in mind, like the average. Um, middle class person that's like investing and getting dividends is not going to be taxed like an S corp or sorry, right. like a C corp. Right. So like a C corp is like, that's corporate taxes mm-hmm. is that, but like, there's so many ways around it. Like <laughs> all of this stuff is so funny to me because like they're talking about these like headlines. It's like, Oh, like cause of the corporate tax rate, guess what we're going to do. We're going to give more money and dividends now because instead of taking corporate profits, we're just going to do distributions through our share to our shareholders. Cause they'll have a lower, cause like, it's going to look good for us to tax people more personally, but then, um, sorry, tax them less and then tax the corporations more. Great. So what are we going to do? We're going to take all these profits that we were funneling through our corporate and we're just going to funnel them down to the shareholders. Mm-hmm. And so there's so many ways around this stuff. It's just like when people <laughs> talk about it, it's like, yes, that sounds good, but everyone's going to go right around it. So when they make tax stuff and like over the next 10 years, we're going to make $200 billion dollars. And because of this, it's like, no, you're not. Within 12 (laughs) months, we're going to figure out exactly how to get around it. Yeah. And so, anyways, this is a big joke. Yeah. Well, the tax code's what, like 440 pages or something? The U.S. tax code. Hey, make it longer. Well, that's that's the tax code, but then there's all the addendums. Hire all your IRS agents. (laughs) Make it more expensive. Make it really complicated. It'll make it harder to win, and it'll make it, you know, the richer will continue to get richer. (laughs) If you make it simple, and you make it where everyone pays the same rate, and like, okay, we're both somewhat religious. I'm a fan of a tithe, dude. Yeah. It works. Yes. Like, I don't care if you, if it is nominal, I, I, like all the sales tax, income tax, we get taxed on every little thing we do, right? I'm a big fan of like, whatever you make, just 10% off the top goes to the government. If you're going to ask for them to provide things like the army and infrastructure and education and healthcare, we should just be like, hey, look, everyone gets a flat tax. Now, I understand there's all yeah, sorts yeah, of yeah, problems yeah, yeah, with yeah, it, yeah. but I think it works. <laughs> and if it's like work, it. you know, you know, obviously I'm religious, but it's like, look, if, if it works in the Bible and this is what it says, I think we should give it a shot. It'll never happen, but it would, that, that policy would also drive um, billionaires away too. However, a lot of billionaires are like, I'm happy to pay, but I'm going to play by the rules. And if these are the rules you're giving me, I'm going to take advantage of totally. them. So why don't we just make it really simple? Like yeah. everyone just pays 10%. Yeah. The average working person would be paying way less taxes Yeah. because they're paying 20, 30% by the time you have state and government taxes. And they're like, get rid of the sales tax and all this other garbage. Just flat tax. Yeah. I said, that's like over Who the camera. Who ran on flat tax? Like last, um, last presidential cycle. Someone ran on that. Asian dude. Andrew Yang? Andrew Yang. Was it Yang Yang? Yeah, but he was, he he had a little slight, slightly differently. Yeah, because he had something super high for corporations though. Yeah. It was like a, it was like an individual. He wanted money to flow to the individuals and the individuals would have a flat. Yeah, he got like dangerously close to a trickle down philosophy as a Democrat. (laughs) I remember that. Yeah, Yang Yang. I miss, I miss moderate Democrats. Yeah. And moderate Republicans. Yeah. I was a huge fan of Andrew Yang. It won't happen. No. There's two, you, the economy's too sensitive to interest rates now because of our debt. 
Yeah. So you can't you can't play with that. Like that would take a huge economic reset, and then we're just not ready to do it. Yeah. You'd have to go back to gold for a while because the, the the dollar would just be completely obliterated. Gold, gold standard. Yeah, dude. <laughs> like you keep a few shillings around. <laughs> <laughs> Any gold uh, bars? Well, no, you don't have to do that. You have to go to the no, gold I standard. Know, I, like know, I know, I know, I know. Back it with something. Well, like I mean, I, we, you know, you don't have to disclose. You keep, do you keep any physical? No. Oh, okay. No, dude. You should Dude, know. if the world's going to hand, do a hand, like going to hell in a handbasket, like <laughs> gotta grab that gold. <laughs> I, I don't think my gold is gonna help me a lot, dude. Uh, you know, economic collapse, prepper. You know? Yeah, if we're having economic collapse in World War Three, I'm like, oh, good thing I got that bar of gold underneath like my to, mattress. No, we're we're off the deep end. I'd like to see you in the apocalypse. Yeah, dude. Just, uh, I don't know how it. you'd function. Let's go, dude. We were talking today about when if Mount Baker blew up oh, in nice. a volcano, yeah. what yeah. we would do. It was great. Yeah, it's a good conversation. Yeah, you know, that's when a helicopter starts to look a little bit appealing. We would actually need a lot of support. I've done this theory a lot. Oh, really? Uh, we, would need a lot of, <laughs> we would need a lot of support from Canada. This is getting very local really? to our area because okay. our county is basically just going to get cut off from the rest of the state. Oh, because of the rivers. The, the way the rivers flow. Yeah. Like, yeah. Whatcom and Skagit. This is getting way too deep. Yeah. I've looked into this. Okay. I've read some studies. We have owners of Augusta Nation up in Vancouver. We'll yeah. be good. Yeah. We'll be good. I've read some studies. Yeah. All righty. Not financial advice for the people. Uh, I don't have any. I'll think of something. Go ahead. You're good. My not financial advice is twofold. One, tune in next week because mm-hmm. I want to continue this tax conversation based off another podcast I listened to with mm-hmm. your favorite, Simon Sinek, but yeah. also Scott Galloway, NYU professor. Oh, yeah. Uh, very interesting conversation about taxes and corporate taxes. Okay. So I'd like to re-listen to it, take some notes, See. and bring that conversation to you. Tune in next week. As well as, you know, I'll just leave it at that. That's okay. it. That's my non-financial advice. Tune in next okay. week if you want more tax conversation. Okay, my, my non-financial advice is put your spouse as a board of advi- on the board oh, yeah. of your S-Corp. So that way, anytime you spend time with your board, <laughs> yeah. you can write it off. Yeah. Just um, keep minutes. Just saying, yeah, keep minutes. The value of the board member to your life and to the business is, is very important. It's good to keep your minutes. Yeah. All right, like and subscribe.